So, thank you, David. Uh, that just got me nervous, so bear with me a little bit. There's gonna be some ums. Um, I also wanted to try and cover some, some additional and new information. Um, so I'll hand out this, or pass it around. Um, actually, I need one. <laughs> As an opportunity to, to kind of get through. Um, I was part of a conversation the other day recently. Uh, let me go back a second, who am I? Um, my name is Sean Garvey, I'm born and raised in Phoenix. Um, I'm actually third generation, my daughter's fourth generation. Um, so we've been here a little bit, uh, lucky enough to see it grow quite a bit. Uh, I went to Brophy and then ASU, uh, and then in 2005 I decided I got wild hair and I went out to Hawaii for 12 years. Um, while I was out there, uh, I bartended at a place called Duke's, um, famous on the beach in Waikiki. Um, great chapter and period of my life. At that point out there, I got into project management uh, of properties and fix and flips, and then, um, and then I got into home inspection. Uh, I started a company out there which still exists. Um, I, I exited when we decided it was time to um, move back to Arizona. Um, when I got here, uh, I actually started a home inspection company in Atlanta, um, which was a product of, of a death of COVID, unfortunately. Um, and then I started Dwell Inspect in whole, uh, Phoenix uh, about five years ago, four and a half, five years ago. And then we started one in um, Idaho just about six to eight months ago. Um, I have a wife, two kids, um, some of which you know, um, and we go to a little school called Christ Church up the road here too. So we're pretty ingrained into the valley. Um, I wanted to go over some of this because um, I was part of a conversation, uh, and then I thought we could open it up. Um, you guys can tell me some of your gripes about home inspections. Um, I can answer that and tell you that everything that David said about that house or condo was true um, or not true. Um, so we can open in that respect. Um, but. The conversation I had was part of a um, goal and business building conversation about two weeks ago. Um, and when they opened up the forum, they basically said, um, what are your goals? And a pretty successful person just said, um, I wanna beat the numbers from last year. And it caused me to, to pause and think a little bit, what does exactly that mean? Um, and she didn't particularly know what that meant. So um, to beat the business numbers for last year, what would that mean to you? Um, would you be happy or successful if it was a dollar? If it was ten dollars, if it was ten million dollars, if it was twenty to twenty million dollars. Um, so it just so happened I was reading a book um, called The Four Dis Disciplines of Execution, um, and that really talks about getting clear and getting specific with your goals. Um, and so, so it caused me to think and reflect on my business, and I've been doing a lot of working and coaching on our business so that we can grow it to where I want it to be. Um, and. And so the first thing to do is to, to basically look at your life um, and evaluate and get clear. Um, and what does that mean, evaluate and get clear? So when, when you say, I want to beat last year's numbers, you want to beat them by a dollar, $10 million, $5 million, you choose um, what the number is because it's, it's your life and it allows you to get clear. And then it also helps to, for you to look into your life wheel. And there's several aspects of your life wheel um, that, that you can get clear on. You can, it's a self-actualization. You can um, take those numbers, rate them on from a one to 10, um, and it allows you to measure and improve. And I've always said, or I've always heard, whatever you measure allows you to improve exponentially. Um, and if you, if you go by that, you can look at your health, family, recreation, travel, career, work, financial, everything at, at that aspect. And if you can create tens in all those aspects of your life, you can improve your life. From there, you can improve your business as well. It allows you to also make a plan. So number two is make a plan. Um, when you make a plan, it doesn't matter what the plan is. It gives you some guidance to run through there, and it, and it gives you the opportunity to stick to it. Um, creating a plan isn't specifically easy, but you have to know where you are currently. You've got to be honest with yourself. Good morning. Uh, you have to be honest with yourself, and then you have to think about where you want to go. Um, and, and you take those exercises through your business, through your life, and so on and so forth that helps you to, to get a plan. Um, the, th the third one is show up and get accountable. Um, so I'm part of a, a what's called a pod group uh, in the business building or the coaching mentorship that we have. Um, so once a week, every Wednesday at nine o'clock, actually it's moving to Thursday at nine o'clock, um, I shut everything down, I get on a Zoom meeting with four other successful home inspection companies across the country, and we have a, a standards and talk about and dissect our business um, talk about uh, activities and growth opportunities and talk about our plans. Um, so show up and get accountable. Find a group or a team that you could work with, which 
there's plenty of successful people in here that you could work with uh, and get accountable. Set their goals, um, have what I call negative um, punishment, which uh, if you don't accomplish those goals, we have to throw $10 into a cup. Um, so it gets a little painful, but you, if you're gonna lose something, you're more likely to, to um, stick to it. Uh, the fourth part is track and adjust activity level. So um, once a week as well, I take two hours and I dissect our business um, so that we can measure metrics, see the numbers that we're, that we're having, make sure that we're achieving those numbers um, and, and continue to grow. And if we're not, uh, then we adjust the activity level so that we do start to meet those numbers. Um, the fifth one is getting into repetition and forming new habits. So 28 days to, to start a new habit. Um, if you can do something every day, start a new habit, just start with small incremental acts and allow those to grow and stack. Um, so the four disciplines of ex execution are discipline of focus, discipline of leverage, discipline of engagement, and discipline of accountability. Um, and so what I wanted to do was the discipline, or what I wanted to focus on was the discipline of focus. Um, ironic. Uh, and I gotta tell you, this book's super boring. Um, it takes a really, really long time to get through, but there's, there's tons of gold through it. So I got the audible version of it. I've shut it down like two or three times and I keep picking it back up and getting into it. Um, and I'd encourage you to do the same. So discipline of focus is on the, really on the one sheet on the back that I gave to you. And this one sheet uh, helps you to deal with uh, your life, um, but also your business on there. Um, and and weight metrics, or, or uh, sorry, physical fitness metrics, um, everything that you may want to go through. Uh, and so I took some time to do that. Um, I'll be a little vulnerable, and I'll talk about some of the stuff that I have on there. And I encourage you to do it together, too. And I, and I did that kicking and screaming as well, um, but my pod helped me to be accountable, so I went through it. So our theme for the business this year is, is rise together, um, meaning that if we can bring up the group that's around us, we can all become more successful, and that includes our family, uh, our business, uh, our associates, our team members, everything on that. Um, we talked about financial analysis in there. Um, so last year, my goal for the business was to be over a million dollars. A million dollars in the home inspection business is, is a pretty high threshold, um, believe it or not. It probably takes us into about the 5% um, of inspection companies across the nation. Uh, and so fortunately, we did break the, that glass ceiling. Um, talked about horizontal income, so passive or residual income that we have in our life. Um, what it costs to, to live our current life and how we can adjust that as well. Um, my 2022 upcoming high, so my top five goals is 10 speaking engagements. So um, thank you, this is number one. <laughs> uh, digital speaking classes. So I want to develop a list of digital speaking classes um, so that we can um, educate other people. So I've talked with David about it specifically, but my goal would be to educate real estate agents about home inspections so that they can have a realistic conversation with their clients and by the time they get done with the home inspection they can look at each other and say yeah I pretty much knew everything that, that was going to be on the report there's no big surprises and that way it makes the transition of the the home inspection to the next steps of the real estate purchase smoother um, number three I wanted to do a marketing uh, master class as well or a digital master class which would basically do that or be a full immersive um, education in that. Um, number four would be to develop two leaders within my team, so two lead inspectors within our team to help manage other inspectors within our team. And then I did a little um, dream, dream graphic of, of what that team looks like um, for this year. And so number one is Sean. I want to have six inspectors, two lead inspectors, one office manager, three client player coordinators, and one marketing rep. Um, so all of that engaged gets us to the numbers that I have goals for 2022. Um, and then our top 20, 2021 high, um, so goals that we did achieve in 2021, um, we developed and maintained staff. So in 2018 when COVID hit, I basically lost all my staff. Um, I had one that left for another job, uh, one that unfortunately developed cancer, uh, and then I had to basically start over. I was hiring. Um, I hired on Monday, COVID hit on Wednesday, and the whole world shut down, and nobody wanted to come to work. Um, so for that entire year, it was me and another guy. Um, we did three inspections a day, seven days a week, until we were able to build back and open back up. Um, in, the, in that past year or two, we were able to hire five other inspectors and sustain them. Um, so 
developed and maintained staff was really important for me because I was uh, doing a lot of inspections, a lot of addicts in there. Um, we identified some leadership within our team. Um, we transitioned the business beyond individual, which is important and tough for a home inspection team. Um, most people get stuck and want to have just Sean, and we were able to add really, really qualified team members that they're getting requests as well. So that was a big victory for us. Uh, we started Boise, uh, which was also good. Uh, basically, somebody called and asked to do a ride along, and we decided to form a, a mentorship and, and partnership team out of that. Uh, and then we exceeded goals, and then we hit $1 million, or over $1 million in revenue. Um, so that was that, and then key lead measures for daily and weekly tracking. So now we have a weekly staff meeting, um, which is super important. Uh, we didn't have that before. It, was, it adds a little bit of structure, and conversation, and check-in, and team unity. Um, so I have what's called a two by two, so twice a week for two hours a day, or twice a week for two hours, I shut off my phone and, and the world can't reach me so that I can work on my business and, instead of being reactive and defensive in my business. And then I have that uh, two hour uh, business analysis. And we have our pod meeting, um, and then we have quarterly one-on-one -on -one check ins with our staff. Um, so we've kind of emerged from, from a home inspection guy to you know, quite, quite honestly a home inspection business. Um, so these are all great things to do. I'd encourage you. I didn't enter all of them, but I would certainly encourage you to do that because um, it, it opened my eyes quite a bit. Um, and then here's the other thing uh, that I find too is why ex execution fails. Um, and this is part of this book. Um, I often live in the whirlwind, so if I don't take time to work on my business instead of in my business, um, that's, that's me playing defense all the time. Um, and it's really easy to feel like when you're playing defense um, that you're busy or that you're productive, but instead you're just being reactive. Um, and when you're reactive, you're not able to grow, you just kind of maintain where you're at. Um, so it's the existing work and the urgent tasks that need attention now. Instead of having, the, they call it wildly important goals or wigs throughout the book. I can never remember that, so I always just call them um, big, hairy, audacious goals or big, audacious goals. Um, but when you have wild, uh, wildly important goals, um, you develop new activities, allows your business to grow, and then you work on the important instead of the urgent. Um, but it allows to, for clarity, uh, allows you to gain focus and get to know where you're going. Um, so that's kind of that aspect. I hope it added some value and, and you found some interesting information on it. Um, anything else, or let's just open up for questions about home inspections and I'll be happy to answer them. Sean, what's this book called? The Four Disciplines of Execution, 40X. Might be the smartest home inspector I've ever talked to or heard. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, thank you. <laughs> you should say him with clients as well. Yeah. <laughs> no, we actually use uh, Sean for all of our inspections. He's, he's amazing. The company's fantastic. You guys are great. We thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Yes? How, how far out, like let's say I need an inspection tomorrow. Can you, can you provide or what's your timeline for um, yeah, good question. So um, most weeks, although the last two weeks really um, are quite a bit busier than I expected, most weeks we're somewhere in the range of 48 hours to 72 hours. Um, we're right around now, Thursday, I think we're, we have one on Sun, an opening on Sunday, and then some Monday we start to open. I don't really. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> that's all right, anybody else who needs to know that. <laughs> I've, I've used them, I think, four or five times, and I've always gotten something within 48 hours yeah. every time. If we have to do a three-day inspection, we call them while our uh, while our offer is in and request them before it's even accepted, just to make sure. And they've always worked really, really yeah. well with that. They've got a great online booking service yeah. as well. Oh, awesome. So you know, get in there and you can see what that is. At, at the total extreme, I'd say that we did a deal actually with Rolla, funny enough, on a huge ten thousand square foot place a couple of years ago. Sean had ten home inspectors there, ten, <laughs> doing it in about three hours in the morning. Yeah. So literally, how big or how small, totally works. Brilliant. Who's that? Who are your inspectors now, Sean? Uh, I have Jeremy, Andrew, Robert, Ryan, Zach, um, and then myself. Then we have uh, four sewer scope guys, and then we partner with the pest control team as well. Um, in conjunction with that, we have two new guys in training, and then I'm interviewing a third tomorrow. So that time period will shorten back down. Do you sure. do any environmental inspections? Yep, uh, so sewer scopes, and then we do air quality tests or mold. 
What's that? Legion of Oh, yeah. And then because of Andrew, we learned how to do Legion of Honor. <laughs> Which I still don't know exactly what it is. As, as an inspector, what sort of behavior do you or would you like to see from buyers, sellers, and their agents? Uh, that's a really open ended question. Um, don't show up. No, I mean, that's, that is a good question. So, um, we have a couple of practices which help give us tips. Um, our office staff are trained in disc assessment, um, you know, personality assessment. So when you book an inspection, we reach out to the buyers and ask, introduce ourselves, um, ask them if they have any special concerns. And in that step, we're able to kind of determine if they're type A type, um, if they're an engineer, if they're a lawyer, what, what have you, and what's gonna make them click. And so that allows us to adapt, or our inspectors to adapt to the, to the client. Um, buyers and agents, uh, even agents or buyers dads, I mean, we want them all. <laughs> I know that's been a meme, but yeah. I have a blog that's gonna, um, that I'm gonna write, which we encourage buyers dads to show up. <laughs> Why not? They're gonna be there anyway, so we might as well get the questions out of there. Um, and, and the ultimate goal is to protect the buyers on all ends. Well, the ultimate goal is to, for people to get the house they want, but to protect the buyers on all ends. And that way, um, and that way, if you get all the questions, everybody working together, you can navigate through the end. I don't know if I've entirely answered your question as, as far as the buyer behavior. Do you like buyers to be there for the summary? 100%. Yeah. Uh, it, it's going to be more advantageous to everyone for the buyers to be there during the summary. Because if they're not, they're looking at a, a two-dimensional computer screen, and it's going to seem like the world's ending. Um, so yeah, we encourage there. We allot at least an hour of time. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Um, and that way we can answer all questions and button up um, any hanging participles on there. Good? Yeah. Another thing Sean does, if your buyer can't be there for whatever reason, is go to a, a phone call with them and go through everything, even a video call. Yep. So you can do FaceTime. Yeah, we've done FaceTime. Um, if they're not there and they don't want to get on FaceTime, we send a report. We've met with some one of your buyers yeah. uh, on the phone afterwards. Because I think it's really important to, to talk to them and help them through. And I think Legionella is a um, bacteria found in water heaters. Legionella. You were asking what is Legionella. It's Legionella. Legionella. Yeah. yeah, often happens in London for some weird reason. <laughs> yeah. How do you know you need it? Yeah. It comes from standing water that's sitting somewhere and then you flow out and then it gets cascading in the street and a lot of people drop dead. I mean, that's basically it. Do you, <laughs> you, often, have, do you often have sellers present during your inspection who tend to disagree with what you're saying or question you while you are doing the inspection? Um, it, it does happen. Yeah, it's not, um, certainly it's not ideal. I mean, I, I truly believe that the buyers have hired us it's their time to, to kind of absorb all the information. And the sellers are, it's their castle. They're going to be defensive of it um, and protective of it. Um, so yeah, they come in. Some are great. Um, they, you know, I've had sellers come in and we walk in and, and um, they're the engineer type. And they say, here are the six things that are wrong with the house. And they were right. Um, and they'll show them to us. And then some of them get really protective about the environment, don't know what condition the house is in. Um, and then when they find out the true condition of it, they get defensive or not angry, but um, let's Sometimes just say rattled. Yeah, or they'll get mad that their inspector didn't discuss. Or they'll get mad. Inspector. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's a that's a good question. Um, I I mean I, I truly believe that it's private time, but it's their house, and we're not going to ask them to leave. So they're welcome to be there. Good. Yeah. Thank you, Shane. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Of course. What other questions? Any other building of business questions, as well as home inspection <laughs> questions? Because that no one's expecting that this morning. Anything else? I would just say that, you know, I think, as you all know, the most important part of a home inspector is their delivery at the end. I mean, obviously, knowing what they're looking at is important, too, but um, they can kill a deal. And if you've got a guy that says the sky is falling, um, their guys are very uh, impartial. They tell it like it is, but they do it with kind of a secret sauce that doesn't come across as making it seem like the sky is falling and you know they don't say oh this air conditioner needs to be replaced well, you know, if, if it's blowing good splits you can't tell me that an 18 year old air conditioning needs to be replaced and they don't do that which is great um, I'm at every one of my inspections whether it's the buy side or the sell side and 
Um, we always use him, but when he's there on the other side, it's nice too. And I recommend you build a relationship with him because you might be on the other side where Sean shows up and then, you know, I don't recommend you go, hey, good to see you. you know, <laughs> Love you, dummy with him, but uh, it, uh, it definitely helps, you know, when you have a relationship. And they're, look, they're still going to tell it straight. Um, even though he knows I'm going to be disappointed sometimes in what he's going to tell me, but they do it in such a way that it's not going to blow a deal. And I've had plenty of inspections where the inspector comes out like the house is falling over. Yeah. Well, and you can tell your seller that you trust his opinions. So right. It's not just an employee like smoke up the fire. Right. And those guys are all really good. Thank so you. So he's trained them well, and um, they're all good with their delivery and the whole thing. Sheldon, I have a question. Sure. Yeah. Anyway, going off of kind of what Andrew had to say, what, you mentioned fixing flips. Like, what's your background, and even the people that you hire's background in construction, so that you can explain things properly when something does come up? Sure. Yeah. No, I work for a. Uh, I, I did project ma management for a guy who was um, offsite, and then he was he would buy and then restore fix and flip houses. Um, so that's what, what kind of led me into this business. Um, all of our guys have um, varying backgrounds. Um, some come from construction. Some, I, I have one that, that has a master's degree in ministry. Um, I, I have uh, one that was a project manager in new build construction. Um, one that basically his only career has been home inspections. Um, HVAC sales, so I, I, it doesn't take, you know, I think that's a little bit of a misnomer that it takes construction knowledge to be a good inspector. Um, in fact, I think it's almost the opposite because when you come in from construction, you come in with some bad habits or maybe a little um, preconceived notions on it. I've trained um, licensed contractors before and, and like what Andrew said, if it was an 18, 18 year old ACE unit, they would basically say that it needs to be replaced, um, as opposed to whether it's functioning or not, because they make money when they sell products. Um, where an inspector's job is to record data and investigate the, the condition of the house. Um, so I, I believe that you can train anybody to be a great inspector, um, because all you're really looking for, remember, um, remember PBS, where it was one of these things, one of these three things don't belong here, or one of these four things don't belong here? That's what an inspection is. is you don't necessarily have to identify what the issue is, but you have to identify what's wrong. Um, so, and it also translates better a little bit, or it translates better to clients because they're not using big, um, beefy jargon that that makes them flex the muscle of, of knowledge. Thank you. Yeah. So, have you ever had an inspection without a grading issue? That's number one. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And then just real quick on, on Andrew's training, um, you know, our guys don't go out in the field because they have a license. Uh, I find that it takes about 100 inspections uh, for them to be pretty much ready to go out on their own. And at that point, we still kind of protect them and do condos, easier houses, that type of stuff. Sorry, Doug. Okay. No problem. So um, I had a listing last summer, so uh -huh. I represented the seller, but it had been under contract in the spring with a different agent uh -huh. twice and fell out both because of the inspection. And I happened to have a copy of one of those inspections because I knew one of the agents that had brought the buyers. And that inspection was maybe 60 pages long. Uh -huh. Whatever, it was fine. So uh, my listing, when the buyer came, they did an inspection. And it came with like, a, the inspection came out with like 250 pages. Yeah. Can you speak to how you might get that kind of you know, vast difference? I've never seen it where it's that like vast. Um, well, a lot of it depends on the reporting format um, and the way in which, because uh, home inspections is a niche, niche business, right? And so there's not a lot, there's no Google out there trying to develop the best software for it. Um, and so there's not a ton of money in some of the softwares. And so w when they put the information into it and spit out in the computer, some of the reports are going to be 250 pages long if the picture is rather large on that. Um, there is a set of standards of practice that we're required to follow from the, the state of Arizona, so that can make the reports bulkier, because um, there's, I think it's about 110, 120 things that are required to be in there. Um, and then in some areas, we, we choose to go above the standards of practice, but that's just in order to provide a better inspection. Um, but that particular inspector may have gone 
way outside of the standards of practice or way above that in order to produce a bigger um, report. Our software has two capabilities, and one is a web-based capability, which is really tight and streamlined, but if you print it out in PDF, um, it ex it's not a, they're not focusing as much on the PDF on it, um, and so it, it comes out pretty long. Um, so maybe that's kind of the realization, or the respect that. But we also put a lot of pictures in there. We probably put, I don't know, 150 pictures in, in and videos and so on and so forth too, so that can add to it. Um, so mostly the software based on software it's, it, number. Well, not necessarily. I mean, it could be a nitpicky report. Um, you know, just wouldn't necessarily know about. But there are some long ones out there. Yeah. For sure. Another question, Sean. Yes. Um, as we know, a home inspector's job is to describe the functionality mm -hmm. of the items that they're looking at. If you have a water heater that is perhaps 11 years old, a roof or an air conditioner that is 15 years old, and it's functioning correctly as it should. Do you say this is nearing the end of its life? It should only be, do you give a warning that it is coming to the, the end of its life? Or do you just report that it is functioning the way it should function? Um, so on the report, yeah, we would, we would, we don't say end of life. We just talk about the estimated life cycles of it. So water heaters somewhere in the range of eight to 12 years. Um, I've seen 30 year old water heaters working just fine. Yeah, exactly. um, so yeah, of course there's a little disclaimer in there. Um, it's not coming out in bright red or hot pink or anything like that, but it says estimated life cycle is, is of a water heater somewhere in the range of eight to 12 years. Um, you know, plant budget accordingly. It doesn't you do, say- You do mention that. We do mention some of it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, and, and that, the reason of that is to avoid callbacks, right? Um, Good. So, but yeah, we're not, we're not saying run out and get, unless, unless it requires it, right? If, a, if you get on a 30 year old uh, concrete tire roof, you lift up the underlayment, you can see wood on there. It's a different conversation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what else? Do you guys get, do very many reinspects? You know, because sometimes people say, I did this, and I've, I've called reinspects before and caught a lot of stuff that was not even touched. Do you guys do a lot of those? or like Probably not as many as we should. Um, yeah, we, we do reinspects. I would say the general average of, of stuff is probably 70% that gets accomplished. Um, sometimes you see way worse. Um, so I would encourage it. It's not specifically easy in our schedule, but we generally make it happen. Um, ideally, we would we would get in, you know, between gaps in our schedule, shoot in, and then shoot out, um, and then report back. Yeah. And just that report, by the way, it's all online. So literally, you can just send the link. It's fantastic. And even like the bits you don't want to see, the sewer scopes and everything else, they're all attached in there. So it's really easy for the buyer to see what they're doing. Yeah, there are, do and you, you can. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the best feature on it by far. It's got it's got a what's called a repair request builder. Um, it extracts every item that was called out in the report, and then you turn on the items, <clears throat> um, and then it gives you a little area where you can, and I don't know the, the basis of your Benzer, but you can ask for repairs, ask for money, um, write a little note on, like, this is extremely important to the buyer, or what have you, and then it produces a PDF, and then you can just shoot the PDF over, you know, right on your copy, see attached. This is not legal advice, by the way. If, <laughs> if that's allowable, see attached. You can use it as an exhibit to your business. Exactly. And then instead of writing 14 points in there, and then they have to reference each one, um, it gives you a document with the photo, the comment, and then the request. And saves you a lot of writing. Yeah. A lot of writing. Sean, thank you so much. We really appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Thank you.